situated and entered in the room here. Uh, my name is Seth Gershenson. I am an associate professor in the School of Public Affairs here at AU. I teach mostly in the MPP and MPA programs. Uh, I'm an economist by training. I study the economics of education and teacher labor markets. And I recently published a book along with two colleagues, Michael Hansen at the Brookings Institute, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, and Constance Lindsay, who is an assistant professor in the UNC Chapel Hill School of Education. Uh, she is here with us today, and I'm thrilled about that. And I am doubly thrilled that Dr. Ramon Goings, an assistant professor in the Language, Literacy, and Cultural Doctoral Program at the Uni University of Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, is also able to join us today and serve as a moderator for our discussion, uh, both with Constance and I as the authors, but also with you all in a Q&A afterwards. And so uh, you'll hear a lot more from me later about the book. Um, the book's called Teacher Diversity and Student Success. It's published by Harvard Education Press. And you can order it right now from the Harvard Education Press website. And there's a 20% discount code at the bottom there, TDSS21. And uh, so that's the book. Uh, and we're going to talk about the book's origins and policy implications today. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. And now I will turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Goings. All right, Dr. Gershenson, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Ramon Goings, Assistant Professor in the Language, Literacy, and Culture Doctoral Program at UMBC. Uh, I'm a researcher on Black male student success, and as well as diversifying the teacher and school leader workforce. And so this particular book is something I'm really passionate about, and particularly the topic. And when I was asked to be part of this, uh, uh, be, as being moderated for this event, I said, of course, because this, this issue is so important. And I want you all to see as you know, students and, and folks who are interested in this work, how you can leverage your scholarship to inform policy and practice. And I think this book does a really good job of doing that. Uh, just to give some context to the conversation that we'll have today about the book is that uh, for those who are not familiar, when we look at the teacher uh, workforce uh, and student population, so US public schools are, are more predominantly have students of color as students. However, our teacher workforce does not reflect the student population with approximately 80% of teachers white being white. And with that, when we see those mismatches, data has shown that there is a, a mismatch between when students receive consequences. So students of color are more likely to receive harsher disciplinary consequences, uh, less likely to have high test scores, and also are limited with being considered for gifted and talented programs. And so when we have these mismatches, you know, it's always like, why is that happening? And what can we do to solve it? And one kind of policy lever has been how do we increase the access and retention of teachers of color in the workforce because we see the inverse kind of relationships when we see teachers of colors in the uh, classroom. Uh, interestingly, though, while this book is in 2021, this issue is certainly not new and it's something as a field we've been grappling with over time. And for this particular book, Teacher Diversity and Student Success, Why Racial Representation Matters in the Classroom, uh, I really I love how the book uh, uses the existing body of literature to then argue that there's a policy window that has opened. And then at this point, policymakers need to take advantage of this opportunity and use these policy levers, which they'll talk about in our conversation to increase the representation of teachers of color. Uh, for our audience that are here, I'd be very interested if you can just drop in the chat, like where are you watching from, you know, your location to be interested to see where everyone's coming from. And while you're doing that, I wanna give you just some context about how the conversation will go. Uh, what will end up happening is that I have some questions prepared for our authors, uh, Dr. Gershenson and Dr. Lindsay, and what I'll ask them their questions. And at that point, what we will do is open it up for audience Q&A. You can use the chat feature to drop those questions in, and I'll be sure to let you know when that happens. And I'm great to see like where folks are coming from, California, DC, this is great. And so to get the conversation going about the book, I'm always interested as someone who writes books and uh, just loves to read, I want to know from both of y'all, like, why did you all decide to write this book? And I'll start with Dr. Gershenson to, to kick us off. Yeah, um, well, I, I should say I never thought I would ever write a book, uh, but here we are. Um, uh, about five years ago or so, I was on my uh, a mini sabbatical at Johns Hopkins, and I started working on some projects about teacher expectations and 
the, the effects of teacher expectations and, and possible racial biases in teachers' expectations. And that work was with Nick Papa George um, in the Department of Economics down at, at JHU. And uh, that, that work got a lot of press and it's been cited a lot. And it really um, it opened, my, uh, opened my eyes to these issues of representation of the teacher force and, and that this really is a, a dimension of teacher quality that had largely been totally separate from the broader literature, literature about teacher effectiveness. Um, and then Nick and I started working with Dr. Lindsay, uh, who's on the chat today, working on a study of the long run effects of having a same race teacher. Um, and, and that paper also sort of received a ton of attention and press. And, and in that study, we show that having even one black teacher in elementary school significantly raises the chances that black students graduate high school and enroll in college. And so then we were like, wow, this isn't just test scores. It's not just attendance or suspensions. It, it's the, the ultimate thing we really care about, educational attainment, long run success. And um, then sort of as luck would have it, uh, I was having lunch with Mike Hansen down in DuPont Circle uh, back when we, when we had lunch with colleagues. And you know we were talking about his research agenda, my research with Constance. Um, we said, you know, there's really, like you said in your intro, there's really a window here. There's really an opportunity to bring a lot of different separate silos together. There's the teacher quality silo. There's the teacher diversity literature. There's the teacher retention silo. Um, and it seems like if we can have those groups join forces, there's really an opportunity here to uh, move the needle on policy. And so we said, okay, well, let's stop writing academic articles for other scholars and, and dusty libraries. And let's write this for policymakers, for teachers. And, um, and then we, we assembled our team and we did it. Perfect. Thank you for that, for that. Dr. Lindsay, how about you? What made this appealing to even, you know, join forces and kind of think through this project? Sure. So, um, so a few things, just, a, I guess, a lot of serendipity, <laughs> as Seth said. So, um, so actually, I used to work at American University. I was doing a postdoc there. And um, around that time, had published a paper with Cassie Hart looking at um, <clears throat> teacher-student race match and exclusionary discipline. And uh, basically finding that, you know, in particular for black students, having uh, a black teacher reduce rates of, you know, sort of the very harsh discipline outcomes. So things like in school suspension, out of school suspension, all the stuff that's like really problematic because it, you know, lowers your instructional time. And, uh, you know, Seth and I had offices maybe around the corner from each other. And then one day he was like, okay, we're going to do all this stuff together. And that's kind of how all of this work started. Um, but was super excited about the book. I too never thought um, that I would write a book, but, uh, you know, at this point we had been talking to so many people about the long run paper um, people are really interested in policy solutions and sort of thinking about both short-term things and long-term things and um, how do we integrate this in sort of the larger literature around teachers so it seemed like a really good opportunity. That's great and I'm glad you talked about this this book is centered like around policy levers that, that's really important to this work like how do we inform policy and, and that helped me segue into my, my question for you all and I'll start with you Dr. Lindsay is that mm -hmm. You know, one of the arguments that I really appreciate y'all are making in the book is that current policy around teacher diversity has a number of pitfalls. And so I wonder if you can just talk about some of those pitfalls and then how do you see the book and as a solution to those pitfalls that you see in the uh, current policy? Yeah, that's a great question. And I mean, I think there's a few ways to answer this. And so, you know, Seth might have a different answer than me. But um, <clears throat> so if you think about sort of the past like 20 years of, of education reform, right? And we've had this sort of uh, continued press on teachers. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the policies around teacher quality and raising qualifications and, um, you know, we have just a lot of policies that sort of on their face are meant to sort of do good, right? But if you don't sort of bring the lens of equity um, and sort of an understanding of local context and, um, 
the role that diverse teachers play in the classroom, you sort of have these unintended consequences that um, impact the workforce harshly. And so I'll go back um, prior to me getting to AU, after I finished my doctorate, I spent some time working out in the real world. <laughs> um, and so I did some work for the Delaware Department of Education and they had <clears throat> passed a bill where they were trying to raise the bar for teachers. Um, and so they were doing things like saying, you know, if you, uh, you know, let's raise the average ACT score it takes to get in the classroom. Let's add on another portfolio assessment. Let's, you know, a bunch of requirements that at their face seem like, okay, this can increase teacher quality. But if you look at it, it was going to disproportionately disadvantage Black teachers. And so that's when I kind of got obsessed with this, with this question, because we have all of these things that are supposed to signal quality that keep folks out of the classroom, but actually aren't related to quality at all. And so I think with a lot of teacher policies, um, you know, folks, I guess you could say their hearts are in the right place. Um, but when the policy actually gets implemented, it has, you know, very detrimental effects when it comes to Black teachers and Black communities. You can also think about school closings, right? There's all types of examples where um, things are going to negatively impact uh, teachers of color. Dr. Gershon, so how about you? What are your thoughts about that? And in particular, you could bounce off what Dr. Lindsay mentioned or any yeah. other insights you have too. Well, I, I think she's totally right about the, the whole notion of teacher testing and teacher credentials really has, has been a, a hindrance to hiring black teachers and teachers of color. Um, but uh, since, she, since she explained that well, I'll, I'll talk about another type of, of failed policy um, or, or policy pitfall. And that is that a lot of the most active school districts that are seeking to increase diversity um, use incentives that essentially poach teachers of color from other districts. And while that might be good for that particular district or the kids in that particular district, it, it's actually a, a zero sum game in the sense that it's not actually increasing teacher diversity at a large scale. It's just shifting around the few teachers of color that, that are already there. Um, and in fact, this might actually be counterproductive because as we find in our, in our long run paper and, and other research shows, even having one or two exposures to a same race teacher really matters. And it's essentially the rich getting richer in a relatively diverse district, um, hiring even more teachers of color away from teacher, uh, away from districts that had few. Um, and so coming back to Constance's point, one of the one of the things we talk about in the book, which which I think we'll talk more about later, is that we view diversity as a dimension of quality. And so, when you do that reshuffling uh, of hiring teachers away from one district and moving to another, you're you're changing the quality pool. Uh, you're changing the distribution of teacher quality. Um, and so, I think that's the other big pitfall that that current policy and practice has has fallen into. Um, when we talk about solutions, we'll, we'll talk a lot about like being creative. And that's, I think, our, uh, hopefully our, our contribution in the book. Oh, thank you for that. And one comment you made about this kind of zero sum game when you, you know, using symptoms to pull teachers from one district to another, you know, with that, you know, you're kind of pointing out and, and painting the picture that there's definitely pipe pipeline issues at various points, right? And so I guess based on from the book, right, you all writing this book, what are some of the takeaways that you have about the pipeline and where should either teacher preparation programs or school districts, where should they focus their attention? Because I think the conversation I have with districts at the state level or even, you know, just districts themselves is like, we don't know where to start because is it a recruitment issue? Is it a retention issue? Is it all of them? Like where, so what advice would you give for folks to start? And I'll start with uh, Dr. Gershenson, I'll start with you. Um, uh... I know this might sound like a cheap answer, but I, but I think you have to start everywhere because uh, as, we, as we show in the book and, and others have shown in the research, it's the pipeline is leaky throughout. And uh, we have to do better in colleges and universities of recruiting into teacher training programs. Teacher training programs themselves have to be more hospitable to a diverse set of students. Um, and supportive. Uh, districts have to be more thoughtful and, and frankly, just do better at recruiting diverse candidates. Um, and then like you mentioned, uh, turnover is, is a big problem. 
However, I, I do want to I do want to stress that the stat that uh, teachers of color turn over and leave the profession more often than white teachers is is thrown around a lot, um, sometimes a, as a pejorative maybe, um, and and in one sense that's true, but it's an artifact of the schools that teachers of color are predominantly teaching in, and teacher turnover is higher in lower performing and, and less resourced schools. And once you control for the type of school that teachers are in, that racial disparity in teacher retention basically goes away. And so what I take from that is we need to support all teachers uh, well, and whether that's with mentoring and resources and supports and planning periods and so on, um, we just have to do a better job of uh, supporting our in-service teachers and the teachers we already have, especially in uh, so-called hard to staff schools. Thank you for that. And, and Dr. Lindsay, before you respond, I wanna just add this piece to it to see what your thoughts are as well, is that mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes I go into school districts and uh, particularly human resources, they may say, we just can't find any, we can't find any candidates of color. So any response when we talk about the pipeline, how do you respond to that when you all are doing this work? Like someone saying, we just can't find these folks that you're looking for. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, well, so I think there's a few things, and I, I think we talk about a little bit about this um, in the book. Um, so one, you have to go to where they're being produced, right? So we know that the nation's minority serving institutions produce more than their fair share of teachers of color, right? And so it would seem to me that if those are the people that are, you know, the institutions that are producing those teachers, you might want to, um, you know, from a policy perspective, give them more resources to keep doing the work that they're doing, but then also districts can, um, you know, establish relationships with those institutions to, you um, make sure that they're they're getting the the candidates that they need and so that's the the nation's hbcus and um, hispanic serving institutions and um the the native um colleges the tribal colleges um but you know too i mean i think we we have these pipeline issues but you know at its heart this is really uh you know a k-12 access issue right we don't have the number of college graduates of color that we like right and so um the pool is limited by we don't have the number of uh, BA holders of color. And so we need to expand the pipeline by improving um, K-12 outcomes for students of color. And so, yeah, we're, we, you know, sort of wherever you wanna intervene along that pipeline, there's, there's tons of work to do. But I also think that's why this makes this sort of an interesting topic to work on because there's, you know, there's plenty of places to intervene um, and get results. No, thank you for that. And I, I think another piece of this, and, and Dr. Gershenson touched on it in his uh, remark before you, just this idea, and you're speaking on like, go to where the teachers are produced, right? And oftentimes in the, the conversation I have, it's often centered around teacher diversity is, um, they often seem like it's, we're lacking quality because we're looking at diverse candidates. I've heard that in my work I do with HR officers, and they say, well, I can't, be so particular and find teachers of color because I may be lacking in the quality of teachers. So this is inherent kind of deficit thinking about mm -hmm. uh, teachers of color, but in your, in your all's book and you have a chapter titled teacher diversity is teacher quality. And so I'll start with you, Dr. Lindsay, can you just talk about how that chapter came together and what do you all see teacher, how do you see teacher diversity as teacher quality kind of combat those yeah. kind of deficit perspectives? Yeah. So, you know, so, so like you said, one of the way, one of the push back, uh, or, or, or where you might hear pushback around this is people will sort of uh, put quality in opposition to diversity, right? And that's a very flawed way of thinking. And so um, our idea is to um, expand the very limited definition of teacher quality, um, which in some in some circles sort of thinking about teacher quality is just the ability of, uh, of a teacher to sort of move someone along on a standardized test, right? Um, and we know there's other outcomes, but our, our sort of, uh, I guess, relatively provocative argument is that um, the things that teachers of color do that produce outcomes are also quality. So, and they should be, um, uh, you know, even to the, to, to the point of needing to be remunerated for that, right? So for example, if you have a, um, a Spanish speaking teacher or, or a native um, Spanish spe speaker who is in a majority uh, Latinx school who ends up being the translator and um, 
you know, makes it such that, you know, families can commute, you know, can connect with principal, the principal or whatever the case may be, or um, that, you know, families can make sure that their students are achieving, then that person should be paid for that, right? Because that is a skill. Um, it's a very necessary skill, uh, given the demographics of the public school student body. And so it's just the idea that um, those activities and actions are, are valuable and that they should be um, uh, just considered, you know, both in terms of things like evaluations and pay, um, and that it's very important not to sort of uh, put sort of quality and diversity at odds with one another. And just because something is more diverse does not mean it is less, uh, has less quality. Yeah, and I appreciate how you said this quality, we put quality in opposition to um, diversity, like kind of like this teacher quality versus diverse candidate. I, I love that, that idea because that's what you see in schools all the time. It's like one or the other, but how you mentioned it, we need to be, we need to think differently and more nuanced about that. And so Dr. Gershenson, anything you would like to add to that? Uh, yeah, just um, <clears throat> like the bottom line is that teacher pay scales are based on things like experience and master's degrees, uh, presumably because those things make you a more effective teacher. Uh, in our long run effects paper, we show very simply that the, the long run effect of having a same race teacher for a black student in elementary school is literally bigger than the effect of a class size reduction. It's bigger than the returns to a couple years more of teaching experience. It's bigger than, it's much bigger than the effect of the teacher holding a master's degree. And so, I mean, it literally is a measure of effectiveness. And if we're gonna treat things like master's degrees and experiences as measures of effectiveness that should be screened on and, and recruited for and, and uh, salaries based on, well then uh, diversity and, and, and uh, representation of the students in the school fit right in line with that. Um, so that's sort of like the practical obvious reason. Um, there's also a subtler legal reason and, and the legal reason is that um, it's illegal to hire on race. Uh, and so you can't just go out and say, we're only gonna hire black teachers this year, or we're only gonna hire Latino teachers this year. Um, that's illegal and runs counter to discrimination law. However, it's totally legal to seek out highly qualified or highly effective individuals for the job. And so, uh, you know, reconceptualizing what, what our measures of effectiveness are to include uh, race or, or ethnicity or racial representation um, is a way to, to legally recruit a more diverse uh, teaching force. Um, so those are the two main things I would add. Also, lastly, um, Constance mentioned that um, you know, the reason for these race match effects on some level is, is teachers of color and representative teachers are doing something differently that works. Well, the, you know, that's an awkward way of saying that they have valuable skills. And so, uh, you know, whatever it is that teachers of color are doing that connects with and improves uh, their students' outcome, whether it's teaching with a culturally rel relevant pedagogy or, or forming better in, relationships, those are, are straight up skills. And in any other labor market, we reward skills, right? And so we have to sort of change the thinking to recognize that it's not magic that, that these race match effects exist. Um, they are highly skilled professionals that are doing their job well. Um, and so reframing the discussion to think about um, this as skills, I think also um, would push back to that deficit narrative that's sort of so pervasive and, and limiting. Perfect, I, I, I greatly appreciate that comment. And for the audience, I wanna bring you all into a scenario to, to kind of show how this research and this book that they're writing is like actually impacting right now. There's certain policy, there's definitely a policy window. I wanna show how that, what that window looks like from experience I recently had. And I'll pitch this question to Dr. Gershenson is that, uh, so in my work around teacher diversity, I was asked to testify beyond, before the Maryland State House of Appropriations Committee and uh, 
State Delegate uh, Amphrey put forth a House Bill 9, 9, 918 that provides student loan forgiveness and it specifically states Black and Latino men and under, uh, other underrepresented teachers. And so in this scenario, we're on Zoom, we're you know, he presents the bill uh, and then it goes out for comment from other delegates. And one white delegate uh, asked to speak and then he just says, you know, he gives this comment about a cousin or a, a relative that he had who was a white woman who does who lives below her means to talk about her income and felt that her being a white woman would not have access to this student loan program because it was explicitly for black and Latino men because they are underrepresented in the workforce. And so he was trying to make the case that this bill was unfair because white teachers wouldn't have access to the same supports. And I just find that I saw it in policy, it just like I just thought I'm in 2021, and this is still the conversation. And you see it in the literature of what's happening. But in these conversations, teacher diversity is often positioned as something that benefits one group and doesn't benefit another group. And so kind of given that context, and you mentioned around, you know, racial discrimination in hiring, uh, what would you how would you re reply to pundits who say that focus on teacher diversity is unfair uh, to current the current white teacher workforce? Sure. Um, I guess two things and a uh, and a disclaimer. I, I am not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV, so don't take any of this too seriously. Um, but I, I mean, I do think that there probably is a little bit of credibility to that legal argument um, that that you can't, you know, uh, you for better or worse, a, a policy that is explicitly based on race can't uh, is probably going to be challenged in court and is probably illegal. Um, and so I think th the way to get around that is to, you know, teachers are, are underpaid generally. Um, so there's no reason that this can't be for everybody, uh, for all teachers of all backgrounds. But um, think about which, which districts uh, have a representation problem, which districts have an achievement problem. Uh, and implementing a policy at the county or district level for which all teachers are eligible, um, well, that, that avoids the legal issue and you target the district or the county that, that needs it. And if some white teachers get the loan forgiveness, um, that's great. They're, they're you know, teachers and we need them and uh, teachers deserve uh, fair pay. But it, you know, if you target it to the specific districts or counties where representation is an issue, you're gonna disproportionately benefit teachers of color and hopefully if it's targeted well and designed well, um, improve the representation of the teaching force and in, increase the diversity in that district or county. Um, the, the other broader comment and, and we, get, we get pushed back a lot, not just that this is unfair to white teachers, but this, this is unfair to white students. And um, we argue, I hope, pretty convincingly in the opening chapters of the book that um, this is actually good for everyone. It's, it's good for everybody of all backgrounds. It's good for the economy. It's good for the country. It's good for society. And, and we say that for a few reasons. Um, first, there are broad spillover effects or externalities of a better educated population. And even if the benefits of a more diverse and more representative teaching force largely accrue to students of color, um, that's still gonna increase the average educational attainment in the country, uh, in the cities, uh, you know, across the country. And everyone benefits from that um, in terms of more tax revenue, more innovation, higher wages in the labor market, um, uh, and so on, less crime, better health. There's all these spillover effects of better education um, that white communities would, would enjoy as well. Um, the other thing that I think is sort of missing is that uh, white teachers and white students would benefit tremendously from having more black teachers in their school. Um, we, we think that there are probably teacher peer effects where teachers learn from each other and learn from working with each other. And a more diverse teaching force is going to help white teachers do better with their increasingly diverse classrooms. 
And similarly for white students, uh, white students also stand to benefit a lot from seeing a more diverse array of people in positions of authority um, in terms of changing their social and racial attitudes. Um, you know, for a, for a white second grader who never sees a black professional um, versus one who has uh, a black teacher here and there, that's gonna totally change their, their mindset. And um, there's a really neat study related to this that, that sort of motivates our thinking on this by Scott Carell uh, and, and colleagues in the US Air Force Academy, where they randomly assign cadets to different barracks and different uh, squad leaders. And there's huge effects on uh, inter-race roommates in year two and general racial and social attitudes of the white cadets when they're randomly assigned to a black squad leader or a black uh, a bunk mate in their in their first year positioning. So I think there's a lot of, of uh, secondary benefits for white students, for white teachers, for society as a whole um, that we can use as, as pushback against that argument. Sure, and Dr. Lindsay, to you, like how would you respond to that comment that you know teacher diversity is unfair to the current white teacher yeah. workforce? Yeah, so 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 that particular example, I feel like is is really interesting, right? Because again, if you're just approaching this from like a colorblind perspective, it seems unfair, right? But the reality is is that black undergraduate or you know um, undergraduates of color are likely to be have more indebtedness than other candidates, right? Um, so my colleague um, Dominique Baker, who's at Southern Southern Methodist University, and I have a paper where we're trying <laughs> to look at. Um, debt burdens and the decision to become a teacher and whether that changes for um, students of color. And basically what we find is that uh, because of, you know, patterns of wealth and, you know, whatever else, uh, 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 underrepresented minority um, college students have to use loans to access college. But once you get past a tipping point, you're less likely to become a teacher, right? And so in that case, we have some empirical work, which is why like this book is important. A lot of the studies that we do are important to basically show that, you know, if you don't sort of redress this loan issue for this particular population, it's going to hurt them more. Um, but then I'll also add to, and Seth sort of alluded to this, which is just that, you know, the teaching profession itself is under a number of challenges, right? And so I always like to think about the teacher diversity piece is just one of those challenges. Like, you know, everybody needs to be paid more. Um, we need to think about debt for everybody. You know, we need to think about, you know, does it even make sense for somebody to stay in a classroom now for 30 years with no um, real appreciation and salary. So I think there's, this is just sort of one, if you think about it like as an umbrella, this is just one spoke of the umbrella. But um, but again, yeah, I'll just underscore that if you're sort of approaching it with that colorblind perspective, then those arguments make sense. But once you sort of think about it, um, you know, think about it critically, you can sort of uh, um, respond to some of those arguments. Yeah, I'm happy you said, you talked about the in-debt, being more in-debt piece. That was the argument I made in my testifying, like the, my testimony to the, the state house was that the, the student loan debt is just astronomical, the, the difference. So I hope you all get that paper out so I can just plop it on their desk. So they can say, yeah. here is the yeah. empirical evidence too, that shows what we're trying to, you know, why this matters and why we need to have certain policies specifically for certain uh, folks. Um, but now I wanna talk about, you know, a lot of, you know, the, the book I appreciated because it's very much, um, the writing style is very accessible. So I know that a lot of policymakers are gonna love and really you know, digest this information and really think about how to like move things forward. And so um, if you can just talk about, I'll start with you, Dr. Lindsay, just what are the, some of the short-term and long-term policy actions that uh, leaders should be engaging with to recruit and retain teachers of color, things that you kind of mentioned in the book and pieces yeah. they need to move forward with? Yeah, so to start with sort of long-term stuff, it's just the expansion of the pipeline, right? Um, just getting more folks in. Um, but that definitely is a, um, you know, you're not going to see sort of immediate effects of that within the next few years. Um, so we spent some time talking about uh, a few things, and I'll talk about it maybe one and maybe Seth can do some of the other ones. But um, we spent some time talking about this concept of just exposure and thinking about creative ways to expose students to at least one Black teacher. So um, one of the um, findings from our long-term paper um, is just basically that having at least one Black teacher really makes this huge difference. And so 
um, we say it that way because we didn't find much by way of dosage or timing. It was literally just the exposure to one. Um, and so we think that that um, lends itself to, at least in the short term, to some creativity around how to distribute teachers within a district or within a school. Um, it also means that, you know, if in the short term we don't have enough um, teachers of color, there's other folks in the community that, you know, perhaps students could be exposed to. Um, you know, you know, for example, if you need to see a college ed educated professional or something like that, maybe there's a mentor, maybe there's, you know, other ways that um, students could get exposed, um, or students of color could get exposed to adults of color. Um, and so we try, we really try to differentiate between things that we think will make a difference sort of uh, now, things that, that districts can do now, versus things I guess you could say the field should be doing to sort of shift, shift the workforce. Perfect. Dr. Ger Gershenson, what, how about for you? What are some of these policy actions that districts and leaders should be engaging in? Yeah, I think uh, I think Constance is exactly right on the, the short run stuff. It really just comes down to being creative with the diversity that you already have. Um, you know, be creative with the teachers of color that are already in your school. Um, you know, you can have teachers trade classes to give guest lectures on a topic they're passionate about. You can be thoughtful in who you bring in to give assemblies and school-wide presentations from the community. Um, I mean, we know that there's, uh, we know that even a 15-minute presentation from a scientist can totally change uh, students' you know, perceptions of what they're capable of doing, what they're interested in. Um, another uh, you know, middle to longer-term thing we do is what we call in the book, uh, lowering the career ladder or adding a rung to the career ladder. And that's really a, a way of, again, being creative, but creatively recruiting into the profession and, and dismantling some of those gates to entering the profession. Uh, specifically what we have in mind is finding creative ways to allow teacher aides and paraprofessionals who are much more diverse than teachers at the moment, um, but they work in schools, they know the teachers, they know the kids. Um, find ways to, to for, for those who want to, find ways to make it easy for them to transition into being a teacher. And uh, one way would be to count some of their already, you know, already performed service as student teaching or, or, or experiential credit hours towards a teaching degree. The other thing is for teacher training programs, whether it's community colleges that partner with universities or whatever, um, to make, you know, make something akin to an, uh, an executive MBA program where teachers can earn some of those teaching credits that are necessary for a credential over the summer or on the weekends or in the evenings and doing what we can to make it easy for them to get there. Uh, we could say, you know, hold the class in a high school and have the professor drive out to the high school and teach the class in the high school in the evening. That makes the commuting and, and child care responsibilities and so on of the teacher aides or whoever's taking the course is much, much easier. It's, it's easier for one professor to travel than for 30 students to travel to campus, especially when you're far from a, from a campus. Um, and then that sort of general idea of increasing access is related to what's known as grow, grow your own programs, which are, I think, a, a longer term solution in that, um, you know, we talked about the pipeline being problematic. Well, the, the, it takes time to get through the pipeline. And so while we are doing some of these things in the short run about, you know, creatively increasing exposures, the longer run goal is still to have a more diverse teaching force. And uh, to do that, I think that these grow your own programs um, have a lot of potential where basically districts partner with local colleges or universities and try to recruit and, and interest high school students into teaching um, you know, early on and, and feed the pipeline early on with high school seniors and, and so on. Um, and then related to that, we could also think about recruiting professionals uh, that already have a college degree and maybe uh, allowing them to enter classrooms on some sort of provisional or alternative certification. 
Um, uh, I think that the gray Rhone is probably a little more promising than that, than that avenue, but the alternative certification, I think, has to be part of the solution because uh, Constance already mentioned um, certification was flat out used as a, as a way to screen on race and um, prohibit, especially after the Brown versus Board decision, to prohibit uh, Black teachers from re-entering re segregated schools. So there is this racial history to the certification tests. And that's part of the reason I think that a lot of charter schools have more diverse teaching forces and, and a lot of alternatively certified teachers tend to be more diverse because they, they sidestep that historically racist teacher screening program. So those are some, some ideas across the timeline spectrum. And again, I hope, I hope it comes across in the book. We have to do all these things. It's not, it's not one or the other. Um, we have to do stuff now that will have immediate effects. We have to do stuff now that'll have you know medium run effects. And then we have to plan for the long haul too. No, I definitely, that definitely comes across in the book and, and something tied to the book. I want you all to just talk about briefly before we go into the audience Q&A. And we have students who are admitted. And I, I want you all to talk about like how as researchers have you all been able to engage in policy conversations because not all researchers can translate their work for academia into something that's digestible for policymakers. And I feel like we might have an audience that wants to figure out how to do that. And so what is some advice you might give to the folks in, that are watching now to like prepare themselves to engage in those policy conversations using their research? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and, and to be honest, it's something I struggled with uh, earlier in my career um, doing those translations because you're trained, you're trained to write for the academic audience in a journal style technical prose. Um, I think the simple answer is just a lot of practice uh, and, and practice does make perfect here. And, and also a willingness and an eagerness to do it. Um, one great way to get that practice and training here at AU is that the SAMI program that you'll be hearing about later has a short course taught by Libby Nelson, who's one of the editor or the chief editor now at Vox.com who literally teaches a, a, a one credit workshop on how to write for a, for a general policy audience. Um, and then I, I think just getting over the initial shyness or whatever of, of um, getting outside your comfort zone of, of talking just to academics. Um, I, you know, and yeah, so that's, that's what I thought. Yeah, I mean, I would just add, um, so prior to me going back to grad school, I actually got an MPP from a unnamed, uh, another unnamed university in DC. Um, and so what's nice about your MPA or MPP is that they actually are training you to do these things. They're training you to write succinctly. They're training you to, you know, be somebody who can use data um, in service of creating or analyzing policies. Um, and then I also was a PMF at the Department of Education. And I feel like AU has a lot of um, students who go off to be um, PMF. So that's a presidential management fellow. Um, and so through those experiences, uh, sort of prior to being an academic, I got uh, sort of well-versed in thinking about how to communicate with policymakers um, and uh, basically how to you know, write and be succinct, so. Yeah. Perfect, thank, wanna, thank you. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, it, 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 at some point I had this epiphany that, you know, the work doesn't matter if no one knows about it. Right, yeah. And uh, <laughs> maybe that I had that epiphany later than I should have, but, but I had it. And then I thought, okay, how many people are really reading these technical journal articles? Well, I'm gonna write a 500 word blog for every technical journal article I write. And um, at least, you know, more people are gonna read that than, than read the articles. And again, the, the, you know, my early blogs probably weren't great, but, but practice, 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 and really just try to write so that you're, my grandmother's not an academic. So I try to write like she can understand what I'm doing and what I do and, uh, and just get, get to the point, get right to the point. Yeah, that's so helpful. I call it the playground friendly writing method, you know, just write for like you're talking to someone at the playground so like someone can understand it, digest it and do something with it and have mm -hmm. that call to action. So I'm glad you all yeah. are mentioning that. I want to open it up. We have about 
10 to 12 minutes or so for Q&A. So if you have a question, go ahead and pop it in the chat. Um, I know I had something earlier from Jade around, uh, the question was, did you find anything on how different intersectional positions are also affected, such as added barriers in addition to race, gender, disability? I think Dr. Gershon, you mentioned you wanted to come back to that, but. Sure. Yeah, so so I don't think we do anything with, with disability of the teachers. Um, although uh, gender is an important one, especially because um, males in general are very underrepresented in the teaching force. Um, and uh, among teachers of color, males are even more underrepresented. And so, uh, you know, does that matter? Uh, the short answer is, is yes. We find that uh, black male students benefit a little bit more from a black male teacher than a black female teacher. Um, however, they benefit from any black teacher, uh, period. And so we, we had a really tough decision to make with the book and talking with the editor about, you know, how big of a, how much of the book should be about gender and the intersection with black male educators. Um, and we ended up, we ended up not making it a major part um, because we didn't want to distract from the, what we thought was the more fundamentally important message, which is that teacher diversity matters full stop. And we didn't want to distract from that message by talking about um, just black male educators or, or vice versa. Um, so yes, they do matter. Um, and there are a lot of great organizations um, that, that specifically focus on retaining and recruiting and supporting black male educators. Um, the, the, the socioeconomic piece is interesting because my, my hunch is that part of the reason that same race teachers matter is that they are from a similar social class or maybe even from the same neighborhood, uh, literally. And so they, they know the neighborhood vernacular, the neighborhood, um, you know, the names of the streets and whatever that um, helps them connect better with, with students. Um, for disability, the one thing I, I think Ramon mentioned, the uh, uh, students of color are under assigned to gifted and talented programs. And a big part of that is because for a long time, those assignments and recommendations were based on subjective opinions of teachers, mostly subjective opinions of white teachers who we know from our other work on expectations have uh, biased beliefs. Um, and so a, a structural policy change that has been shown to really work is to do what's known as a district-wide screening. Uh, throw away you know, what Mrs. Applebottom thinks about Jimmy and instead test Jimmy along with everybody else. And um, that universal screening catches a lot of students of color who would have otherwise been who, who otherwise not would have not been put into a gifted and talented program. So that's another easy fix type policy that we can implement right now. Perfect, and we have a question It says, is there a correlation between a diverse faculty force and diverse curriculum? So essentially, is there value in recognizing race across disciplines or should the brunt of the work be left to the social sciences and humanities? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so I can just speak to that in the context of training um, undergraduate teachers. Um, and uh, some of the work that, uh, that I've done looking at sort of this, who produces um, what, you know, the, the fact that sort of the minority, basically in schools of education um, in pre pre predominantly white institutions, they are less diverse than the student body. Um, and one of the things that we sort of heard anecdotally is that um, for the students of color who are attracted to teaching, one of the things that they're attracted to is sort of uh, social justice or um, equity focused orientation that they don't see reflected in the curriculum of the traditional training programs. Um, and so, you know, therefore they're sort of not attracted to education. Um, and so, you, you might expect that the curriculum um, would get better with a diverse faculty, although not necessarily, right? Um, but it's sort of incumbent upon all faculty to kind of consider, you know, um, you know it, it, 
introducing students to, you know, social justice or other critical ways of sort of um, um, looking at the world. But no, it definitely should not be uh, just left to the social sciences and humanities. It should be integrated everywhere for sure. Any addition to that, Dr. Grishenson? Yeah, um, I mean, I, the evidence shows that, that representation matters uh, literally at every level of schooling from pre-K, elementary school, high school, uh, even in law school, having a same race uh, professor improves grades and, and performance. Um, and it's across subjects as well. So it, uh, it's not just in certain you know, history or social studies type classes that, that these effects are there. Um, this does remind me though, a really interesting program in California I think it was, it was either Los Angeles or San Francisco, had a program where they provided ethnic studies courses to high school students. And um, this had a, these, they were basically low performing students at risk of dropping out of high school were required to take the ethnic studies program. And, and the high school was, was majority black and Latino. And just taking the ethnic studies program significantly increased graduation rates and GPA. Um, and, and a similar, uh, I think the Am I My Brother's Keeper program, is that mm -hmm. it? Yeah, they're both in San Francisco. Both San Francisco. Yeah, I mean, that too was a program where they specifically recruited black male educators from the community who were known to be good teachers, but were also known to have good roots in the community um, you know, they, they knew people and, and were trustworthy and so on. And that program too had a, had a huge effect. And that's, you know, both of those programs are sort of bridging the representation piece with the curriculum piece. And there's, there's definitely complementarities there. Um, coincidentally, that program is another example of how you can make the most of, of what you have in terms of teacher diversity because those, those classrooms were segregated. Only black, I think, was it only black males or only black students? The resources went to the black males for that my yeah. brother's sister, yeah. So, so the, the classrooms were segregated in that sense, but just one class per day. And so that was a way that, that they created that exposure for all of the students of color, even though they didn't have a, anywhere close to a representative teaching force. Mm -hmm. And so there was a question that was presented to me kind of around, you know, the book is focused on education, but they're making a case that these arguments are probably very similar in other spaces, right? And so if you were talking to other policymakers who are maybe looking at different, say, labor markets, what advice would you have for them in order to take kind of what's happening around teacher diversity and apply it to another policy arena to increase the representation of folks in that particular market? Uh, well, uh, one, one easy thing is related to the uh, district-wide screening I mentioned. Um, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about giving employees, you know, who to promote into a, into a leadership position, uh, if you only listen to advice from current leaders, you're going to have that old boys network that, that's just going to give you more of the same. So <laughs> taking a more holistic assessment of everyone in the organization to find your next leader or find your next promotion um, is probably helpful and a, and a sort of a principle to live by here. Related to that, we, we talk in the book about the Rooney rule that the NFL uses to encourage um, diversity among the coaching ranks. The rule is legal because it doesn't have anything to do with actual hiring. It just says that you have to have a somewhat diverse interview pool. So again, um, adopting a policy like that, um, you know, might open who, whoever the hiring agent is, if they're required to have some diversity in the pool, uh, they might be surprised at the, you know, quality and, and abilities of the um, people of color in the pool that runs counter to their own biases. Um, so those, I think those are the two sort of general principles is to be more structured um, in, in hiring and promotion to avoid the, the old boys network problem. Yeah. Do you wanna add anything to that? 
Yeah, I mean, I would just add that, you know, so, you know, one of the things that I, I, I said in the past is that um, this is going to continue to be a problem again, while we just don't have the numbers of BA holders of color that we need, right? To the extent that that's a barrier to entry to a lot of um, industries, all the people are going to be fighting over all the same small set of kids. And so the answer is to expand, right? And so whether it's through um, thinking about sort of alternative ways to enter into particular industries. Um, and I'll just, I'll go back to one of the things that we talk about in the book uh, is this concept from industrial organization called the diversity validity dilemma, which is basically like a lot of the um, things that we might use to, you know, determine entry into an industry also themselves exhibit achievement gaps. Um, and so in that case, like Seth said, you might want to reconsider, you know, how you're bringing folks into a particular industry and whether that's actually related to eventual effectiveness. So I think that there's there's lots of opportunity there. And so as our last question, we're getting ready to come up on time, but there's a question, a good one. Do programs like TFA, Teach for America, or programs like Teach for America help with addressing a lack of diversity in the teacher pipeline? Yeah, so I can answer that. So TFA is actually second na nationally, it's only second to the minority serving institutions as producing um, teachers of color now, because they had a shift in how they approach things around 2012, where half of their incoming cohorts are students of, or, you know, teachers of color. So they're actually contributing a lot um, to the diversity of the workforce, which, you know, depending on your stance on TFA could be a good thing or a bad thing. Oh, thank you for that. And then go that ahead. It wasn't always true. It was not always true. Yeah. So that's why I said they, they had some uh, organizational like shift around 2012, I think that. Uh, In response to that criticism. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and to close, I want to leave because at least some folks with some value too, is this that what advice would you both give to our students on how to take advantage of their grad school experience? You know, being faculty, knowing what you know now, how could students make the best of where they're going? to in the next year or two? Well, I would say if you're going to school in DC and you're a policy person, that's, you know, the world is your oyster. There's plenty of opportunities for internships, et cetera, um, that will give you, you know, invaluable experience that will last you the rest of your career. Yeah, and, uh, and, and your classmates too. Um, it's not just, you know, professors and bosses and, and, and outside people, but your, your colleagues and classmates too are going to be, um, you know, peers and uh, <clears throat> colleagues for life. So take advantage of that. Um, I mentioned the SAMI program. I'm, I'm a little biased because I'm the director, but I think it has great opportunities um, to sort of build your skill set outside of the traditional academic skills. Um, and also, I think my, uh, looking back on my own experience, uh, I wish I had been a little more open um, early on in the course taking process um, uh, in terms of like what you're gonna study. You, you're, you're obviously gonna, or you're probably coming here with some idea of what you're interested in and that's great, but, but do take the time and think about how you can learn uh, from all the classes and all the perspectives and topics and policy issues and disciplines um, and how those ideas can, can come back and help you on, in your own specific area. Um, and talk to the faculty. The faculty are happy to talk. Um, you know, one of the selling points is relatively small classes or, or very small classes relative to some of the other schools. Um, you know, so take the time to engage with your faculty members and professors and talk about your work, talk about their work and so on. Um, before I forget, the, uh, a recording of this, uh, a recording of today's discussion is available. They just posted the link in the and chat. Um, I'm sure they'll be tweeting it and putting it on Facebook and whatever later too. Um, so yes, I yes, hope so to see some of you at you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I'd go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say, uh, thanks everybody for coming and I hope to see some of you uh, at AU in the future. And I wanna thank Constance Lindsay and Ramon Goings uh, again for participating. Uh, 
this was, I enjoyed the discussion. I hope everyone else enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, have a great day. Now make sure you go all grab the book as well. It's a great book. So make sure you pick that up. Thanks everyone. Thanks.